Welcome to How to Live Slow, the podcast where we discuss slow living for the modern woman and help you design an intentionally slower family life. I'm Rochelle Glendon, your personal slow living coach and host of this podcast. I know all about busy, but I love living slow. Enjoy the show. Well, welcome to another episode of How to Live Slow. I'm here today with my good friend and mutual podcaster, slow living enthusiast, Susanna. Is that now she's finished? So I'm trying to get her pronunciation <laughs> correct, but you'll have to correct me again. But welcome. Susanna is from the Nordic Mum and is a podcaster and now author, which is very exciting. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, you pronounced it correctly. That was lovely. Good. I'm so glad. So we've been connecting a lot over the time that we both sort of, well, you started your podcast well before me, but we've kind of had this mutual trajectory of being on Instagram and podcasting. And now you're writing a book and mine's shelved at the moment, but it's, we had some time where we did some clubhouse chats together and we've really connected over our mutual love of slow living. And now with your book, I've learned a lot more about your perspective on Nordic slow. So tell us a little (laughs) bit about you and the book and yeah, everything. (laughs) Yeah. Look, I would say that my background, I'm from Finland originally, but I live in Australia and I've been here since gosh, 2008 now. And I lived a big corporate life. And then I moved away from that after having children. And I moved down to the south coast of New South Wales, where I'm living now. And to me, you know, the life really was the slow lane ever since having children. And the podcast that I did first, it was about Nordic lifestyle and all this Scandinavian and kind of trying to find my own voice in terms of living overseas and trying to keep yourself connected to your roots and your history and your culture. And I was doing the podcast, which is still live and out there, kind of being intrigued by other people. And I noticed that I was interviewing more and more people who were authors. So I think back of my mind, I was already kind of getting into the fact that I would like to write a book. And I did not talk about it for a very long time until COVID hit. Mm-hmm. So 2020, I attempted to on the quarantine and lockdown that we had, I was attempting to do it, but it just wasn't working. And I thought I can just take all the information I had in my website, put it all together and voila, here we have a book. <laughs> it was not that easy. And I was like, hey, I have 14,000 words. I'm rocking it. And then I realized it's really not just putting a blog post together. You probably could write a book like that, but I don't think you would sell very many. (laughs) Then I kind of shelved it. And then 2021 lockdown, July, I'm homeschooling my kids. My husband is home 24 seven. And I said, I really don't have any excuses. Like I know world is going mad around us and crazy things are happening. And I really need to get this book out of my system. So it really probably took me like three months to write it. And I was writing the book and I get to December 2021 and I realized I was stuck. I was probably about 24,000 words and I realized I just didn't know where to move. And I think that's when we had this conversation back in November last year when I was like, oh, I'm stuck, you know, and I was asking some advice from you and you then connected me with Chris Emery, who became my uh, editor. Yeah. And, and we had a conversation and she was able to kind of direct me where I had to go and get the book finished. And then we were just over 30,000 words back in February, March, when I sent it to my editor to be edited. And here we are in July and it's been published. I had a lovely designer, Bea Custodio, who is based in UK, who did the the cover, which is absolutely gorgeous, and also designed the internal, the formatting and the layout. And I just today got my first five-star review in Amazon. So I was really stoked with that. <laughs> the book was out on like Thursday and I'm like, yay, please give me reviews. And I was five-star <laughs> reviews and I was so excited about this morning. So here I am. So Nordic Lifestyle and the book is 
about not just the Nordic life, but it's also about the happiness and how the life is different at the Nordics. And maybe for people who have never been Europe or they have never been in that side of the world and they're intrigued by the culture and the history and why is it so great to live at the Nordics? <laughs> and I'm here in Australia and I think Australia is great as well. <laughs> and it's also about the, you know, how life there is really slow. Like, I don't think the people at the Nordics actually say we live the slow life it's kind of like just the way the life is and they're just happy with small things and they don't have that kind of ambition to have too much you don't need a lot to be happy is basically what the life at the nudics is about yeah i mean i've always had a slight obsession with like i would say scandinavian culture but I've since learned that Nordic and Scandinavian is kind of like, well, do you want to explain what the difference between the two is? Yes. And this was interesting because my editor, Chris, was just like, I never knew the Scandinavian and Nordic difference. So Scandinavia is actually a language group. Yeah. So Scandinavia <laughs> is Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden and Finland. But then the Scandinavian language group is Iceland, Norway, Denmark and Sweden. And the Nordics is all those countries plus Finland. So, but um, lots of people in US, UK and Australia and in general, they use those terms Scandinavia and Nordics together. Like they're just the same meaning words at their synonyms right. when they actually are not. And then there's the Fenno Scandinavia word as well, <laughs> which I put it in a book because my sister was saying, but you have to mention Fenno Scandinavia. So Fenno Scandinavia is Scandinavian countries plus Finland. But it's probably more used in the Nudics themselves, the Fenno Scandinavia word, rather than outside. But Scandinavia and Nudics, they are two different things. Scandinavia is the Scandinavian countries which have the similar language, yeah. similar cultural background as well. And they've been connected through history. They've been like Norway used to have Denmark, Denmark used to have Sweden and so forth and so mm -hmm. forth. And Finland is the odd one out because our language is slightly, you know, no, not slightly, a lot different. Yeah. Is it Yugoslavian style? Like, is that? Uh, yeah. Different uh, language. Yeah. It's Finno Ukri, Ukri language Ukri. group. Yeah. yeah. And it's part of like Hungarian and Estonian are part of us. So I can understand some Estonian. Estonians normally can understand Finns. And there's some language in Siberia, some tribes in the really up north there they speak similar language but I've never heard those languages so I don't know if I would understand them yeah okay yeah so interesting I really and that's what I was kind of like when I read the book I was not expecting it to be such a rich like cultural heritage like you cover so much in there like about the Vikings and actually one thing that really stood out to me around equality and how even back so far as, yeah, no, thumbs up for that. Um, you know, like in medieval England, when men could own a woman in like Viking, or was it Viking culture or in like in that similar time frame in the Nordic countries, women were able to get a divorce and they could take their dowries away. They could set themselves up like a completely different thing. And looking at the way that we've evolved into the modern world, how obviously that is so represented in the way that women but the equality levels in the Nordic countries are just so much better. Yeah, and I had so much fun when I was doing research for yeah. that particular chapter about Vikings and the gender equality in general. Yeah. Yeah. Because I knew the gender equality is such a, I don't know, we are more equal at the Nordics, let's just mm -hmm. say it full stop, than a woman in Australia, in New Zealand, US yeah. and UK. But I never had kind of looked into it, the history of it. I had never kind of look into the Viking part of it. So I was just like, yeah, this is actually true. So it yeah. does make sense why the Nordics are always top of the gender equality reports. And, yeah. you know, you look at the prime ministers, everybody except par one at the moment are female in the Nordic mm. countries. We've had female prime ministers, female presidents, and it's not there's no glass ceilings for women anymore. Yeah. But coming back, what you said about the Vikings... So Vikings were actually, they were, they didn't call themselves Vikings. They called themselves yeah. newsmen. And they were just farmers. They were just fishermen who just had, you know, this enthusiasm to go and explore the world. And of course, we want to steal your women and we want to steal your, you know, like gold and jewelry and whatever you had. And unfortunately, the northern part of England was most of where they 
<laughs> made their raids in Europe and in the beginning of the Viking era. So they were just, you know, like someone who just wanted to see the world. And maybe that's why the Nordic people tend to travel a lot. And we, you find us everywhere, you know, like we are mm-hmm. everywhere. Yeah. And yeah, the gender yeah. equality really started, in my opinion, and my research, based on my research from the Viking era. And it has really you know, represented itself today at the society, which you really, as a woman, you have same opportunities and men. And saying that, you know, yes, we live in Australia. And I think there is this kind of fraction happening in the gender equality conversation. And it's great to see that, you know, it is going to the right direction, but there's so much more that can be done and should be done. And it all starts from, I think, from the top. And uh, hopefully, I'm not going to go to politics, but hopefully the new government and those policies that they put in place will kind of shift the whole gender, you know, conversation and shift it kind of the right direction and kind of really pushes it out there. And that, you know, we will see that yeah. years to come, those decisions, you know, made us, you know, better as a country. I 100% agree with you. And I know like, you know, we skirt around this topic of politics just because ooh, <laughs> slow living, but, you know, and it's meant to be about, you know, enjoying coffee and walks in yeah. nature. But actually I really have realised recently that slow living is highly political because of these things of not having the equality and also, you know, politics and is all about this creating environments for business to grow and, you know, be more and, you know, well, like you said in your book, the the Nordic or the Swedish, what's the word about lagom? Lagom? Lagom, lagom, yeah. Lagom. About, you know, not wanting more than you need, like always just being content with enough. And I think that that is in so many ways, you know, political as well in, you know, there's so much in it, isn't there? Like, Yeah. And I think we have, because we come from this kind of westernized culture where we always want to have the newest car, the newest clothing, the newest house, and we always are more, 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 Mm. when we just never really stop and we never really kind of look at our lives. Are we happy and content just what we have? So for example, here in Australia, the conversation about the $10 iceberg lettuce is a good example oh, that gosh yeah people are getting bonkers that they have to pay I saw seven dollars I was actually a <laughs> surprise seven dollar iceberg lettuce and I said but what about if we all would grow our own we live in a country where we can grow our own we, it's not that this is Sahara desert so yeah. what we've done with my kids we the end of the lettuce we put it on the glass a little bit paper and then like a glass jar and water on it so it starts growing roots and it starts growing up again and then we just move it in our veggie patch and I said we don't have to buy the $10 lettuce because we have enough and we can actually give some for our neighbors and it's like you don't have to have everything to have that kind of contentness in life and I think you're right about the political question, particularly with COVID, lots of people have realized that they don't want to have the business, they don't want to have the big life that they probably have get used to. And they realize that, oh my gosh, I'm living in this big house. I have kids, I have husband, and I'm happy just the way I am. But then Mm. they start looking around them like, but am I happy in this big house and the big car and the big salary? No, I'm actually not. And yeah. you have exodus to the countryside of, you know, big cities because people just realize that life can be much more simple with, you know, much less. Yeah, absolutely. I've definitely realized like even more, like I think like my slow living journey started 10 years ago. And even now I'm back to and of conversations I'm having with clients and people on Instagram and friends in everyday life after COVID has, you know, not stopped, but after COVID restrictions have eased so significantly, people are feeling the pressure to get back to what things were mm. and they're, but they're burning out much more quickly. Oh, I'm just feeling so much more overwhelmed. And it's like, well, why can't I keep up anymore? I used to be able to do all of this. And it's not because like, I just think that there's a shift, isn't there? Like even myself, I'm like, I actually don't want more. I want to figure out how to simplify even more. And I've realized a lot of the decisions that I thought, you know, on the trajectory, like I thought I was actually quite slow, but I've got so much more work to do myself. (laughs) Mm. And I remember speaking to a friend at the beach here and he was builder 
And yeah. he normally works like 24-7, like seven days a week. Mm. And he had to stop. He couldn't go anywhere. And he said to Susanna, first time ever, I'm at the beach here with my children. Look at them to play in the sand and I'm happy. I did not realize his kind of life could yeah. exist. And then now I saw him and he said, yeah, I'm going to work, but I only work you know, seven till three. I don't do extra projects. I don't work in the weekend so I can go and see my kids, pick up them school and go and see their sports when he was missing out on all of that. Yeah. And I think it's like a, you know, mental shift that people are doing in terms of looking at their lives and wanting to understand what the happiness is yeah. and what does happiness mean for them and how can I actually have that kind of COVID happiness and continue it and not to go back to the bad old habits, which, you know, I think we all have had. Oh, yes, absolutely. And in your book, you actually mention it, The Year of Living Danishly. Yes. That book. And one of the things that she noticed, and actually my boss who left to go and live in Denmark as well, mentioned that the culture in, and I assume it's for all Nordic countries, is you finish, these are your work hours, you finish at five, and you go home. And if you're there late, it's like the boss is saying, hey, what's wrong? Are you having marriage problems? Why aren't you at home? Like, (laughs) 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 go and be. And there's a sense of equality. Everyone mingles within different clubs and, you know. Yeah. It's like the live the work or work to live mentality, isn't it? Yeah. And I, it was a shock when I moved to England because it was the other way around, you know, like it was like busy, 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 go, go, go. Mm. And your social life was very much geared towards, you know, your work life and you, your workmates became your social life as well. And you, the pub, you know, pint after work kind of thing. Yeah. And and it was shock because in, in, you know, Finland, it's like you do your work, you go home. Unless you have a job which requires you to be on call, which, you know, if you're a doctor or, or some kind of um, emergency yeah. services kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But it's very much about that, you know, work is work and life after work is life. And yeah. everything in a society in a Nordic country is geared towards having that quality of life after you've done your job. You know, it's not that you bring your you know, work home. And my husband who works at home sometimes, and then he has to, you know, keep up sometimes in the weekends as well. It's kind of like, really? You know, my son was like, daddy, why do you have to work? It's like, mommy never works. <laughs> I was oh, like, yeah. <laughs> I work, I work really hard, but I just don't get paid for it. In a, or I get paid for a different way than my husband does. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, right. yeah. It is, it is different, I have to say. And I think it's, again, it comes from the political question to me, because this is the way the society is built up and this is the, what the government and all that is kind of pushing us to do. But it will kind of like, let's see next five years where we are in terms of what changes there have been implemented to kind of protect people from the burnout and, you know, protecting people from getting, you know, to the point where they are not useful as an employee anymore. And I think yeah. the mental health and all that comes to play as well. Yeah, I think you're right. The mental health and yeah, just I think what really highlights to me is that, you know, obviously Nordic society is not fully 100% perfect. There's always Mm. going to be things, but the difference is that the importance placed on those things, like let's talk a bit about the difference between now, actually, I think what we were talking about is equality, but also the need for more and the difference now between contentment and happiness and I want to say the word huga to me is contentment versus there's another word that means joy and happiness that's similar to huga. Is it lika, luka or something like that? Luke, yes. Luke, okay. Yeah. I'm just remembering off the top of my head, so I am <laughs> well, that's not. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> is there, there's a difference there, isn't there? Like happiness and contentment aren't the same. Yeah, they're not, but they those words are used kind of like meaning the same. Yeah. So there's a lot of talk about huga as contentment and look at that more as happiness and, and vice versa. And I think it's like, do you need to have a word for it? Really? Yeah. Like yeah. contentment and happiness to me equals pretty much the same. Like yeah. I know contentment and the word happiness, if you go dictionary wise, they're not the same. And if you look the definition of those words in my book, they are not mutually, you know, inclusive. But saying that 
I think the Nordic happiness and the model of the way people live their lives is pretty similar in all those countries, no matter what word describes them. Mm. I think the kind of taking small things in life and enjoying them, like you said earlier about walking in the woods and walking in a forest, like that's the forest therapy that the Japanese people talk about. And that's like everyday person can enjoy it. You don't need to pay for that. You, it's every man's right to go and walk at the woods mm. in all the countries. And it is just like the thing that, you know, like maybe the Australians is the equivalent of barefooted at the beach. Yeah. You know, connecting yourself to the nature and listening the waves, or maybe you surf at the waves, but just, you know, being on that moment. And that's the happiness. It's the small things. It doesn't have to be anything major to create that kind of zone to yourself where you can go into to connect yourself, you know, for the moment and connecting yourself with the nature. Yeah, I see what you mean. I guess it's the difference between like, you know, all of those basic needs are taken care of. So there's a real sense of safety net and, you know, that every man's right to nature. Like I remember when we went to Copenhagen and there's the, in the city, all of the buildings along the river still have a walkway so people can access the river because everybody needs to be out. There's no private beach. It's not a thing. (laughs) No, private is very much public. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Now, one other thing that's like this total sidetrack, but it's just popped into my mind talking about private and public is I remember a little Instagram post you did recently and you said about how you haven't had a proper sauna in four years because you haven't been back to Finland oh. and how you just wish you felt that cleanliness of having a sauna. <laughs> like- I know. I mean, I have to say that it's different kind of, what you call it, is it a phys- ph- different kind of feeling of cleanliness? Yeah. If you don't have, if you don't have sauna, like I remember that when I've been away and then I go to a sauna, you're like, oh my gosh, I feel clean again. And it's yeah. almost, it purifies your soul, not just you, yeah. your skin, but it's yeah. also, it has a bigger meaning than just, you know, cleaning you physically. And it's mm-hmm. like, you go there and you relax and you're just like zoning in to the moment and into yourself and how you're feeling. And that's why in sauna, you don't talk a lot. You are just there to enjoy the heat and sweating all your worries and all the negativity out. And just, you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why, you know, the happiness comes from film. Maybe it is sauna. We've been all looking at all completely wrong and thinking it's something completely different, but it's actually sauna is why we are so happy. And I'm actually yeah. very unhappy because I haven't had sauna for so long. <laughs> oh, will you get a sauna at your house? <laughs> I was going to ask you about will you get a sauna at your place, but also is it true, I think you said like Finland is particularly sauna-based, like there's a million saunas and 1.5 million people or something like this. Yeah, like a- don't ask me how many million there is. Yeah. I can't remember it myself, but it's far, there's, oh. There's five million of us, but it's there's like a sauna in every other house or something ridiculous like that. Wow. If you look at the, but every house will have a sauna because it's yeah. part of the culture. Like yeah. you go for maybe a swim in the ocean, we go for sauna. Yeah. And it doesn't matter whether the weather is plus or minus outside, you will still have a sauna, whether it's winter or summer. Yeah. And answer to your question, well, we had renovations in my house during the COVID and I desperately wanted to have a sauna, but there just wasn't room there. But my husband said, maybe somewhere in the future, we will build a sauna in a back garden. But he's also worried that, you know, you're going to be running up and down between the house and the sauna naked. So he's like, (laughs) I know your fins and your nudiness. So it's like, I'm a little bit worried about that, you know, how that's going to go down with the neighbors. But we have big bushes around, so I might be fine. But yeah, so maybe some point in the future, I will have my own sauna outside, maybe even a pool, fingers oh, crossed. Dream or a cold water Dream, shower yeah. or something right next to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so good. And have you got any plans, travel plans to go home? Have you got family oh, still over there? Or? Yeah, all my family is there. I'm the only yeah. one. I'm the black sheep living uh, overseas as yeah. far as you can get, really. We were going, we were thinking about this year, but it just wasn't the right time in terms of work and everything else. So Mm. we kind of said, let's go next year and let's start looking at the flights and early on. And it's going to be a longer trip because we haven't been there for like four years by then. 
Yeah. And, you know, people are getting older and we're getting old. Our kids are growing and you really want to go and enjoy. But then because my husband's family is in England, so we always have to go England right. and Finland. So I think last time we did 11 flights in total flying around. Okay. It's crazy. <laughs> yes. <gasps> so you might go so, for a few months. Yeah. I would like to go longer this time around just yeah. because the kids are older and I think there's more to see. And I think we're in a place where we could take that, or at least I could take a chunk of time and just go and explore more. My husband yeah. might be just quite, he said he's quite happy just to pay us the flights to go there and stay, but I want him to come as at least part of the journey and be there with us. But yeah, yeah I'm, I've never been homesick, but during the COVID lockdown, I really felt maybe I was reading too many horror stories of what's happening. I was really getting homesick. And now yeah. with the war in Ukraine and all the things that are happening with NATO and Finland and Sweden joining NATO, it's kind of like, yeah, you kind of you become more aware of how precious life is and how short and long the time is, you know, yeah. as well. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you. It just feels like not urgent, but it feels like like if you've got things that you want to get done with your life, like, and this is the dichotomy between like what you want to achieve and how it feels really urgent to get it done versus like slowing down and taking your time and pacing, isn't it? Yeah, that dichotomy between feeling like there's things that you just need to get done with your life. Like it's really brought all of that, not urgency, but that sense of, you know, life is actually quite short and we've got to take what we want out of it versus, you know, allowing time to unfold and let things happen naturally. But yeah. And I noticed it like when I was writing the book is that I really was like, you know, I have no excuses now, so I really need to get it done. And I had talked about it to my friends, but not kind of publicly, like I'm writing a book. And then when I actually told people I'm writing a book, it kind of put a pressure on me that I really need to get it finished. Yeah. But I wanted to have that pressure because that made me finish the book as well. But yeah. it, you're right there. Like, I think life has kind of showed us that, you know, no matter what we want to achieve in life, there, it's limited time that we have. And we have to use that for the best of ourselves. And sometimes what is best for us might not be the best for the family or not, might not be the best thing that the husband thinks that you should use your time or your your loved ones might think that you should do something different. And I said to myself that I am a little bit selfish here. I want to do the writing part that keeps me happy and keeps me sane. And yeah. I want to continue doing it. Hence the book number two is on the making. Oh, but, very exciting. Uh, <laughs> but when that will come out, don't ask me. <laughs> but it's kind of like it's creative, like outlet for me, like podcasting yeah. used to be. But I had to stop the podcasting because I couldn't do that plus writing. I had to give away something. And maybe I'll go back to podcast in some point, but now I just feel that the writing is kind of the creative, you know, mm. outlet that I need to continue doing. Yeah, I totally understand your feeling about writing. I've really, you get too into it, don't you? And it's Yeah, the zone, yeah. the flow, and it's kind of coming out and you just have to continue because you want to finish it. You can like just stop it. Yeah. So something about writing books, is it a Nordic thing? Because I read in your book that in Iceland, one in 10 people has a book. Yes, I think it is. Because after I published in my personal Facebook, you know, that I have written a book and I've published, so many people have come back and like, oh, this has been my dream. I'm so happy for you. Like, oh, tell me how did you do it? Because I self-published it. Yeah. So it is. I think it is. And we are, because of the library system that the Nordic countries have, it's very much geared towards providing books to people. And I think it kind of, people are readers, readers, people are Nordic countries. They love to read. They love to publish. And I did look some statistics about publishing books in the Nordic countries. And there is, yeah, the Iceland is very much an exception. But even the other Nordic countries, there are more books published per capita there than in some of the other Western countries. So it yeah. definitely is. But I think it's come from the library system and the encouragement of people to read from early on in their lives. Yeah, amazing. And potentially that ebb and flow of nature, like, you know, I think, well, where I'm from, closest to the equator, you're a little bit further south than me, but we have, there's not much fluctuation in the days. And winter here, like it's 20 degrees here today. It's the middle of winter. You know, we're all like, oh, it's a bit hot today, you know, <laughs> and it's winter. But we don't have that drive to just be okay with being inside and 
writing and being creative versus in summer being outdoorsy. But, you know, like there's not that much of a shift and maybe that's where it comes from, the darker winter. Why yeah. not write a book during that time? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, like you stay more inside. You have inside activities mm-hmm. and, yeah, you read more maybe because you're inside. But, like, I remember from my childhood, my grandparents, if I was staying with them, they always had a book by their, you know, bedside. They yeah. were always, and there was a pile of books from the library or they <laughs> had bought books. And my mom is the same. Like, there's always books. My sister is the same. So it is kind of like because you see everybody doing it and the library system is free, it's available for everybody. You can borrow books, videos, you know, audio books, e-books, everything. And it's very much geared upon towards serving the people and giving them something. And it's Mm. free. And, And the library system, amazing. You even have library buses that come to the villages far away if they can't get to the uh, actual uh, library to bring the books for them that you can order books and it brings the books or you can just go to the bus and you can see what is available there so it is it, we, we are you know countries you know people who love books yeah and as a side note I think I even read that you can rent electric push bikes through the library yes <laughs> in you can some rent areas. a person as well in Denmark this is you can yeah. rent a person to understand more about the culture and maybe because they're immigrants of their backgrounds there's libraries for everything and anything. Libraries are actually, you can just go in. There's no people actually working there that much anymore. So you can just yeah. use your card to swipe yourself in, borrow your book, and then you just swipe, you know, you do a self-service checkout and you can swipe and get out from the building as well. So there's, it's very much, you can go any time of the day there. It's not just like it's between hours nine and five. Wow. Such a, I love, I mean, I, obviously, like I said at the start, I'm obsessed with different cultures in across the world. I mean, <laughs> but particularly the, well, I was going to say Scandinavian culture, but actually <laughs> <in the morning. laughs> now I know the difference. There's always so much more to learn. I really enjoy the book and I'm so honoured for you to come and chat with us today. And yeah, it's been great. Any final things? Because I know that there's so much to talk about. Have you got anything final you want to sort of share with us that? I would just say that, you know, writing book is hard. So anybody listening there, if you're doing a podcast or blog, you have website or any kind of thing, it is hard work. And writing any kind of material, content, Instagram, whatever it is, it's hard work. And then writing a book is like, it's a long form way of writing. And you don't need to have the degree to be able to write. You don't need to be creative, you know, writing professor from the university to be able to write a book. If you have a story and if you have something inside of you that you feel that you want to express it in a form of a book, then go and write a book. It's yeah. the hardest part is just putting your bum in a seat and finding the time to do it. And there's some advice people say you have to write every day. Well, to me, that's just BS. It's not true. You know, if you just find 15 minutes today to write 200 words, that is good enough. And don't measure your success with word number of words if you're writing. Measure it the time that you spend writing rather than the actual words, because you might have 15 minutes today, you might have two hours tomorrow, and you might do 2,000 words tomorrow. And I think writing is a great, you know, where maybe it's journaling for you, maybe it's mindfulness and getting the, you know, things out of your system. Maybe those journals one day will be a book, or maybe they're not. Maybe they're, you just need to have them out in the system. And I find that I have mental blocks about certain things which I have to work out for my system before I perhaps can write the next book or the fictional book because there were so many things I wanted to put in this book that I left actually out and I'm thinking there's probably another book mm-hmm. of things that was left out and kind of colliding those together. But there's so much things that you can do and I think I encourage people if you really want to write to go and write. Yeah, I love that. Such great advice. And the art of writing is a real practice in slow living. Like that's what I I would like to finish with is that like we say, oh, well, slow and, you know, the urgency of time and slowing down. Actually, slow is the answer still because it allows you to focus on the thing that's important. And like you said, if you're writing a book, you need to be able to find the time and the focus to see through a project that might have no end date. And isn't it interesting that we actually do find the time for something that we are really passionate about? So we will really find the time to do that. 
if we really want to do it, then we might find time to scroll down in a Instagram or internet or whatever else. And we realize hour is gone when we could have actually spent that, you know, meaningful. So I think you have yeah. to kind of, yeah, I think slowing down and slow living, like, you know, just having the time to do what brings you joy and what, you know, brings you happiness. Yeah. The discipline. Mm. as well yeah <laughs> the discipline to be happy right yes yeah. exactly yeah having Thank a sauna you. in between <laughs> yes I know I want to get I want to have a sauna now you made it sound so good <laughs> all right so the next book is in the works where can we yes. find you tell us about it so this book so the Nordic lifestyle is available in all the places like Dimux, Barnes and Noble, Booktopia, Amazon everywhere really online so you have an ebook and you have a hard copy and I'm making the audiobook. So the audiobook should be coming in the next few months. So I'm narrating it myself with my Finglish accent. So it's very authentic. <laughs> so that's coming next. I might do a Finnish version of this one, but you can find me on probably more active in the Instagram. So the Nordic Mom is my handle. And I will be selling the book also once I've got my shop up in the nudicbalm.com. So I will have the book up and sell it directly from my own website as well. Oh, but man. it's it's on most of the big, bigger shops at the moment. So you can find it there. And actually, talking about libraries, you can get it from the library as well. So you can go to the library and you can ask them to, if you don't want to buy it, just ask them to order it for you and they can do that. Oh, what a great advice. Yeah, cool. Good idea. Yeah, I think the library is such an important and valuable resource. We need to utilize it, it more. And it's free. Well, where taxpayers are paying for it, but it's kind of free, quote, yeah. free. It's like a place you don't have to spend money to go. Yes. Which yes. is, we need more of that. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been Thank so you. lovely. Thank you for having me. We'll chat soon. That's it for another episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you'd like to connect further, the show notes from today's episode, including all the social links and free resources are over on my website, howtolivslow.com forward slash podcast. Have a beautiful week ahead and I'll speak with you again soon. Mm-hmm.